I said, uh, actually, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Eugene Turk. I'm the Vice President of Business Development at Align. And I wanna welcome you all to this month's Coach Webinar. Uh, I'm really pleased to introduce today's Coach Webinar speaker, Glenn Dahl. Uh, Glenn began his business career in marketing and sales, quickly earning a reputation for taking on challenging roles and growing revenue, customers, and teams. Uh, he helped grow a $400 million private company to more than $2 billion through an IPO, international expansion, and product diversification. After that, he was tapped to lead the turnaround of an ailing public company as both CEO, I'm sorry, COO, and then CEO. And in those roles, Glenn and his team took the company from multi-million dollar losses to profitability and 40% growth in 18 months. Today, Glenn is the founder and leader of Apex North Business Coaching, dedicated to helping others grow their careers and their companies. Glenn and Apex North work with CEOs, business owners, and entrepreneurs to help them find a path forward and set the vision for their company, strengthen their leadership team, and get the team engaged in the vision, and keep the team focused, accountable, and executing on the vision every day. He recently helped co-author the book, Rock and Sand, A Practical Insight to Business Growth. And in addition to being a business coach, Glenn is a noted keynote speaker and fun fact is also a semi-professional DJ. Uh, before I turn it over to Glenn, one administrative matter. Uh, we want this to be as educational and informational for all of you as possible. So please don't hesitate to ask questions of Glenn via the Zoom chat feature, and we will be sure to direct those questions to Glenn and have him try to answer as many as he can at the conclusion of the presentation. Uh, again, thank you all for attending this Align Coach webinar, and we will now turn the microphone over to Glenn. Thank you, Eugene. Great introduction. I like how you slid the DJ part in there as well. So big, hairy, audacious goal. This webinar is about how do you define your big, hairy, audacious goal for your business? The term was coined by Jim Collins in the book, Good to Great. And what we'll do in this webinar is we'll take you through some concepts and tools on how you can work with you, yourself, your vision, and your team to develop your very own big, hairy, audacious goal. I use a couple of other terms in my practice as well. And one of the ways I think about the big, hairy, audacious goal is what's the Everest? What's the North Star? Where do you want your grand vision to be? And many times as I start talking about, I start seeing something up and off and in the distance, just the way the North Star appears in the night and the way it's helped us navigate since the beginning of man time. Um, you can see it there in my logo. That's the peak, and the curve represents the path to growth, and the star is the North Star. As Eugene said, I am co-author of the book Rock and Sand, Practical Insight to Business Growth. This is an initiative for myself and several, actually I believe nine other Gravitas Impact Coaches. If you're interested, the book is available on Amazon, and uh, the growth tools that we'll talk about here are available online as well so you can search on those or I'm sure that Eugene will be sending a link where you can access some of the growth tools yourself. 1962 I was born I'm a child of the 60s I was born in the early 60s I wasn't very cognizant at this point in time but for those of you who do know your history of this time period the US and Russia were engaged in the Cold War and there was a race to arm each other with the very best in nuclear missile technology so that um, there was assured mutual destruction. Uh, as part of this, Russia had sent the first man into space in Sputnik. It was widely perceived that Russia was ahead of the United States in space technology and therefore in missile military technology. Um, president Kennedy, is, Kennedy was often viewed as a great, great president, but he did have some rocky patches in his time. Uh, one of them was right before this time period, when he had also authorized the CIA to send a covert invasion team into Cuba that was called the Bay of Pigs, you may have heard that, that was a disaster. So um, Kenny's reputation, the United States reputation, 
was a little bit on the rocks at this point in time internationally. And President Kennedy felt it important that he step up, take a leadership role for the United States and for the world. And in 1962 at Rice University, he made a very famous speech where he stated his big, hairy, audacious goal. If you listen to the video of this, you'll see that he used the term, we choose to go to the moon many times through his speech. And he was able to galvanize and capture the fancy of the entire nation and actually the entire world by saying the United States will put a man on the moon within the 60s, within that decade. At this point in time, many people, many people did not believe this was possible. They didn't believe it was a smart initiative to do. And much of the technology had not even been invented yet. And Kennedy admitted this in the speech. But he said, we will invent this technology. We will come up with the metal alloys required to send a rocket to the moon. And sure enough, in 1969, Neil Armstrong said this famous quote as he stepped onto the surface of the moon, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The BHAG had become true. As Eugene said, I had the opportunity to become CEO of a publicly traded company, Insignia Systems. This picture was taken in 2013 on Broadway in front of the NASDAQ headquarters. And it was really one, a very proud moment in my life and for my career, what I saw as the pinnacle of, of my career, being promoted CEO of Insignia Systems and having this picture taken. This was a proud day for me and a real proud day for me as well was earlier when the board of directors had voted me in as CEO. And for those of you who have run a company, that's the moment of, I've made it, right? And I moved into the big corner office, big desk, nice views, and sat down at my desk and then said, shoot, what do I do now? For while I've been in training for this moment much of my life, I have to tell you, I didn't take a class to be a CEO. Uh, there was no training in an onboarding program to become CEO. And as I opened the desk drawer, there was no manual for CEO. What did I do? Well, looking back in that desk drawer of that big desk I was sitting at, there actually were three envelopes with a sticky note on top. And the sticky note said, in case of a CEO crisis, open the first envelope. I was like, this has got to be a joke. I don't know. Who knows? So I put them back away. I kind of forgot about it. So as Eugene said, we had some success with the company and did a lot of the work that I think many of you who have led companies understand and know needs to be done. Uh, some of the really tough work and we were successful. But as oftentimes happens, and I'm sure you always happens in our career, uh, I hit a bit of a crisis. And like the CEO in this slide, I didn't really know what to do. Because as CEO, everybody looked to me to be the rock, to be the source, to be the visionary leading them. And sometimes we don't have all the answers. We think we need to. I think we think our uh, teams, we think the teams need that answer. They need our confidence, right? So as many of us have done, I'm sure, I went in, shut my door, and put my head in my hands just like the CEO is doing. What do I do? I didn't know. It's a big problem. Well. In that moment, I remembered those three envelopes in my desk drawer. So I opened the first one, and it was a sheet of paper, and it said, in time of crisis, blame the previous CEO. Genius, right? Why hadn't I thought of that? Of course. So I went before the board, and I blamed the previous CEO. It was all their mistakes, their fault, and I was going to fix it. Sure enough, we figured it out, got through the crisis, went well. Well, sure enough, six, eight months later, another crisis, right? But ha, I had the envelopes. So I went in, I couldn't wait to see what number two was. I opened number two and number two said, blame one of your top managers and fire them. I'm like, well, that's great because there's actually one member on the team who's really not pulling his weight. I don't think he supports me. And so did that. Sure enough, figured the problem out, went forward. Well, as things happen, a little while later, crisis number three, but I had this one. I had no problem at all. Went back to my d desk, opened the drawer and took out envelope number three, pulled it out. And it said, write three letters. Okay, the second part of the story wasn't true, but the first part was. Big, hairy, audacious goal. Who is a tennis fan and knows what just happened in 
the US Open. This 19 year old Canadian girl, Bianca, defeated Serena Williams to win the championship. As a young girl, she had written a check to herself and updated that check every year with the prize amount for the US Open. And sure enough, visualization, she imagining herself as a champion, winning the US Open worked for her. It wasn't just that, obviously not. There was a lot of hard work that went into it, a lot of sacrifice and a lot of struggle. But as a big, hairy, audacious goal, I think this is very impressive. The fact that someone so young with a huge aspiration, certain ta certainly talent, was able to use this very compelling vision, her North Star, to drive her to do that work, to pull herself up in hard times, to go to practice. After she became injured, she rehabilitated and got right back in the game. And sure enough, she won. To me, this is a very, very impressive example of a big, hairy, audacious goal. So the big, hairy, audacious goal, there's three components to it. And I would submit that if you and your team do the work right and come up with what is a very compelling, very exciting goal, it can make all the world's difference in your success and in your business. I recently worked with an executive in transition and we were talking about a couple different companies that she had opportunities to go work with. And one of the questions I always encourage people like that to ask is speak with the CEO and ask, what is the vision? What's the culture? Talk more about the company than the specific role. And in comparing two companies, one CEO was able to, when asked that question, really illustrate a really compelling, a really exciting, big, hairy, audacious goal, vision for his company um, versus the other CEO who couldn't. Well, guess which company my executive wanted to go to work for? The one where they would be excited to go to work, the one where they're excited to join in with the team and make big things happen. That's the company. And for you, your company and your team, I'm sure you want this too. Three main components that Jim Collins talks about in his book and that we use in our coaching practice and in the Rock and Sand book is first of all, is figuring out what is your pur purpose or passion? What can you and your company be best in the world at? And what is your profit per X? These are all hard concepts. They're easy to concepts to talk about, but they're sometimes really difficult to develop, especially in a simple, succinct manner for your own business that you can talk about and, and communicate really well within the company. But I assure you, you spend the time and do them well. It's world changing. Here's a graph of how that arrives. You come up with the three of those and they're all unique and they're all specific and they're all very, very clear and true about your business. You'll come up with what Jim Collins calls a hedgehog. The hedgehog being it's an impenetrable, competitive advantage. So criteria for developing a BHAG, it's generally very far out. As I said before, it's that North Star that's way up high in the sky. It's the compelling vision that when times are tough, when you have tough decisions to make, you can use this North Star as your guidance. And if it fits within that compelling framework and the path to achieving your vision, It'll make those decisions much easier. It also makes it a lot easier to get through the tough times. It challenges you to greatness. It is big. It is audacious. It's hairy. But it, thinking about it gives you goosebumps. If it just makes you stand up and lift up your head, you know you've got it right. You've gotten it right. You need to make sure it reinforces your business fundamentals. We'll talk a bit more about that here. So one of the fundamentals is profit per X. This is something that we talk about. There's a separate worksheet. What is the industry standard benchmark for your business? What's the widget? What's the one thing that if you consistently produce more of that you'll drive your business profitability and cash flow and revenue? What you units, when you think about this, what could you focus on that if you can optimize those that maybe your competitors aren't thinking about? 
One example of this that we use is in the airline business. So for years, most companies focused on airlines focused on revenue per seat. That was their X. Well, Southwest Airlines, who you might know, one of the most profitable, successful airlines in the United States, has consistently thought about their profit per X as wheels up or planes in the air. They use a lot of organizational procedures. They have a lot of policies. They have, their whole infrastructure is built to keep their one airplane that they fly, the Boeing 737, in the air the maximum amount of time. And by doing this, they, they've been able to be consistently profitable. So what I would encourage you to find your own profit per X. One of my clients, Commerce Custom Jewelers, has found their profit per X and actually found it twice. So I worked directly with the CEO of Commerce Custom Jewelers, Sarah Commerce, and she's also featured in the book. Um, this was a retail jewelry outlet. And what we found when we first started looking at profit per X, which we identified as profit per customer, we saw that many times customers would come into the retail store and they'd be looking for a $100 pair of jewelry, uh, or sorry, $100 pair of earrings, Maybe they had a watch that needed a new band put on it. Maybe they had a gold chain necklace that had broken. And when they came in, they would ask a lot of questions and look around and try things on. But ultimately, the profit per customer, given the overhead of a retail outlet, the time for the salespeople, and really the time in the store, really wasn't that strong. We worked on transforming the business model. Commerce Custom Jeweler now, as you can see, is now a private jeweler. So Sarah? closed down the retail outlet. She located the business in a small studio in an industrial area not far away where her rent and overhead were much lower, um, but a very cool area and a really cool space and now only accepts appointments from her top customers. So that transformed her business from several hundred dollars, actually less than a hundred dollars per customer to several hundred or more uh, dollars per customer visit because each customer now, we eliminate a lot of those walk-in lower profit customers. Um, then one of Sarah's clients, who's a very high-end client, had asked Sarah if she could um, meet on a Sunday and, and would Sarah mind if she brought some friends for a consultation? Sarah readily agreed. She actually said, why don't I host a little brunch? I'll get some pastries and we'll have mimosas. Well, sure enough, um, this wealthy woman, who is a great customer of Sarah's, brought three of her friends. Well, you can imagine what happened with four friends uh, talking about jewelry over mimosas. Sarah's profits skyrocketed. So from that one example, we actually then, again, transformed her profit to per act from profit per customer to profit per appointment. And you can imagine what that's done to her revenue and profit. Core purpose. Second leg of defining your BHAG. So what is the core purpose? That's the higher purpose in your company, that's why you do what you do versus just making money. Because we can all make money at something. We can all make money at many things. But really, what drives us to get up in the morning? What drives us to go into the office? And what drives us to do what we do? If you can truly identify that, share that, and then ensure that you're bringing on team members that are equally as inspired by your core purpose, again, I guarantee world beating. The core purpose, it's not something that changes. It's fundamental to your business and why you do what you do. It inspires change. And it's the difference your company makes in the world. Not to say that we all need to run nonprofit organizations for the betterment of mankind, but tr truly you think about a, a great product, a great service, it can change people's lives. All right, personal example. Um, I have children. Many years ago when our daughter was born, um, we took her to Disney World when she was three. It's the first time I'd been to Disney World. I was very impressed with the organization. It was beautiful, great vacation. But there was one instance. Um, my daughter, was, at three years old, was relatively shy. She was a big fan of Cinderella. So we went to Cinderella's castle at the appointed time for a meet and greet. There's a long line of children. And my daughter was too intimidated to go stand with some of these bigger kids and really intimidated by Cinderella in real life, which we all know is a cast person, right? So um, we stood over about 20, 30 feet away and tried to encourage my daughter and she wouldn't go, she wouldn't go and she cried a little bit. Well, the line of children went down and after probably about 20 minutes, Cinderella was still there and she looked around and saw my daughter and actually beckoned for her to come over. 
and my daughter went over and I get goosebumps telling the story still. Um, she called my daughter over. She spoke to her for five or 10 minutes, a little hushed conversation. And my daughter came back and shared what a wonderful story that Cinderella and Prince Charming had invited my daughter to come visit them for tea. And, and my daughter is, was just transformed. This was her Disney experience. And later on, there's a parade in Disney World. We were there and my daughter was on my shoulders. And Cinderella, the same cast person playing Cinderella, came by on a float next to Snow White. And she was waving to everyone, probably the princess wave like this. And she saw my daughter and pointed at her. And I just came, I couldn't believe that she remembered my little girl from that morning. And then she also nudged Snow White and asked her to, to point at my daughter daughter and they both wait right at my daughter and I have to tell you I no matter how much the Disney World vacation costs that moment made it life-changing happiness that's what Disney had brought us brand promise this is a difficult concept I find with many clients I think many of us are really good about talking about what we do in our business the features of our business but when it really comes time to talking not about us but about our customer about them um, I think we struggle with that. So brand promise is the third leg of defining your BHAG. You need to know what are you promising? What's the clear benefit that your core customers are receiving? Generally, three are best, and you want one lead brand promise. They need to be measurable. They can't be fuzzy or soft. And frankly, the best of them have a guarantee. One clear, really easy example that I use in my coaching dates back a little bit to Domino's Pizza. I think many of us do, do, do you remember when Domino's Pizza had the guarantee for their delivery, 30 minutes are free. And how many of us sat there looking at our watches, hoping it got there on the 31st minute while it was still warm, but we could get it for free. Domino's continue, discontinued that policy. There were some safety issues associated with it, as you might be able to imagine, but that was a clear brand promise coupled with a guarantee. Those are the best. An example that I found recently is a company that I am looking to work with. I'm actually sponsoring my first leadership retreat in Costa Rica on January 27th of 2020. So if any of you are interested in joining us in Costa Rica for just a life-changing experience with other leaders and entrepreneurs, let me know. Be happy to accommodate you. But I found the website for this agency. And I really, really was impressed because right off the bat, they had a very clear brand promise that spoke to me as someone who had organized this retreat. I'm on the hook to rent an entire resort along with a couple of coaching colleagues. I need to fill up that resort, right? So more bookings and increased revenue? Who doesn't want that, right? It's a great brand promise. Now you look down and you can see for yourself, that there's secondary brand promises. It's concierge done for you marketing strategy, right? I'm a coach, I don't have time to think about marketing strategy. Probably not even my expertise, right? I'm a CEO. So to have someone who will guarantee me more bookings, more increased revenue, and done for you marketing strategy, right? I'm almost sold. I did ask them the question, what's the guarantee? They didn't have a guarantee. I faltered. They still haven't sold me. Maybe someone's watching right now. Okay, so I promised you some tools. This is the BHAG tool. This is the tool that you can use with your team. As you can see, we have our brand promise over on the left, our core purpose over on the right, and our profit per X. You can download this tool, you can use it yourself, or as most of my clients do, you can hire an experienced coach to help you in this process. Of course, that's what I'll recommend. All right, I'm gonna leave you with a story about one of my own clients and their very compelling, big, hairy, audacious goal. I'm unfortunately not able to use the exact client because they wanna keep their strategy private. They're a privately held company and uh, they intend to dominate. But let's just say it's a team sport. And when I first started the engagement with this company, I spoke directly with the CEO and talked to him about how his company was doing and his revenue expectations. And he talked to me about his company. They were coming out of a startup phase and they had done pretty well, but as many startups do, they had burned a lot of cash. They now needed to convert to profitable growth with the cash flow. 
They have recapitalized new investors, they had some new people on their team, and he wanted to work with a coach to really get his business humming. And he shared with me his revenue expectations currently in his model. And he shared with me that the reason he was hiring me as a coach, as a, his business coach, was that he wanted to double that revenue expectation over the next five years. And after talking with him and learning more about the company and the team and the business fundamentals, and I, I signed on for that because I really believe this company could do it. In our first strategy session, we got the teams together over two days and broke down the business and built out a strategic plan for them. And when we talked about their core purpose, many of the people on the leadership team and many people in the company were players for the sport, whether in high school and college, even currently, some still play the sport. Um, they were all, they had all been involved in some form of athletics and they were all very team oriented. They're all very coachable as well, which I find uh, working with former athletes, which is a, great for me as a business coach. Um, so they had a core purpose. They, they were about the team. They wanted to change the game and they want to enable players in this particular sport to be the greatest they can be. So they want to give them the greatest equipment, their sporting goods equipment manufacturer. They have a very proprietary technology, which is um, very compelling that they can use and, the, and their brand has a really strong brand equity with players in the sport. So through, um, through that, we, we worked on their brand promises, we worked on their core purpose, we worked on their profit per X, which really comes down to the one specific component in the, the sporting goods category, one, one portion of that um, component that they manufacture themselves. So the more that they could drive popularity of the sport, usage of their equipment, the more that they would then drive the manufacturing of this particular piece, which is their profit per X. So you can see how this is all building together. And here is where we emerged. The CEO stood up once we had nailed their big, hairy, audacious goal, and he shared his vision with us. He said, in 2028, in the Olympics, all of us here are in a suite. We're in the LA stadium. We're looking down on the field and marching on the field. The men's and women's team in this particular sport are outfitted head to toe in our gear. Now, I get goosebumps right now telling you that story because I want to be there. That's compelling. And I literally said out loud, I'll sign up for that, as did everybody else on that leadership team. Can you imagine if you're interviewing to join this growing team, growing company, because they are growing and they will grow, how exciting that would be for you, especially if you shared the core purpose. If you were an athlete, if you played the sport and you recognize how strong this brand is and the quality of their equipment, it's incredible. It's incredible at driving a team. It has so many ancillary benefits. The CEOs talk to me about how can they retain employees? How can they find employees? It's so tough in the labor market. Everybody wants so much money. And this is things, these are the things that enable you to build a great team of A players that are concerned more about the purpose and what they're doing and where they're going and who the leader is leading them than about do they get another dollar an hour than maybe some, when they work somewhere else. Along with that compelling vision came some very key strategic initiatives about some other equipment lines for the sport that this company would need to move into, which the team felt very, very strongly that they could do and that they could do with every bit of high quality as the key component that they manufacture. So in building out that plan, the team actually arrived at a very, very compelling revenue number that was twice again what the CEO had originally envisioned when he and I talked about his vision and why we should work together. So if that story isn't enough for you to want to start tomorrow on your very own big, hairy, audacious goal, compelling vision, I don't have any more that will. So thank you for listening in. And I wanted to share with you my own brand promises for Apex North Business Coaching, my firm. First promise for business owners, for CEOs, entrepreneurs, and owners, 
is that you will grow your business. My second promise is that you and your team will have clarity on the path to achieve that vision. I guarantee it. And I guarantee that you and your team will be aligned and accountable to each other. If you're a business owner, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a CEO, how valuable are these things? I know because I was there and many times I found, I found myself lacking here. And I didn't quite always know how to lead and I didn't have three envelopes in my desk drawer. But I really did find that coming up with a compelling vision of where we wanted to take the company was really effective in rallying the team around that centralized vision and driving it forward. So I do have a guarantee. I guarantee value greater than any of my clients' investments in their coaching, or I, they can cancel in 30 seconds. That's right. I said that one time and someone said, 30, 30 seconds? Seconds? I'm like, yes, absolutely. However, I can also fire you in 30 seconds, which gets people to think and holds them accountable to the process. If I fail to do this, I'll return the most recent fee. No one has taken me up on this. And every single one of my clients has achieved business growth. And that's something I'm, I'm really proud of. It's also something that, that really gives me great pleasure because my purpose is to reach back out to my former self as a CEO and be the person that could be there for me in absence of those three envelopes. So again, thank you for your time. And just one little nugget, if anybody's looking, that is uh, my DJG persona on the screen behind me in this picture. All right, Eugene, go ahead. Thank you so much, Glenn. Um, we will open the floor to, to questions. I did want to throw out an initial question just to start the conversation. Um, obviously, a BHAG is something that you're looking towards you know, 10 or 30 years down the road, as you, as you said. Um, as, a, as an organization, as a company, do we change our BHAG uh, when we pivot our business based on external factors? You talked about your jewelry client who changed her sort of profit over X, but did that really change her BHAG as well, given the changes that she understood about moving from a retail location to a private jeweler and then moving it rather than uh, profit per appointment to profit uh, per session? Yeah, Eugene, that's a, that's a great question. And yes, a BHAG can be adjusted. It can be changed. Uh, we do know what pivots are. And it depends many times on how specific the BHAG was when we first developed it. But an example from my own, from Insignia Systems, when I first took over the company, it was in such dire straits that our initial BHAG was to stay in business and to not go bankrupt. And certainly as we evolved and we were able to achieve that, we started coming in with more and more evolved um, BHAGs. What do you tell, what do you say to CEOs and business owners whose BHAG is um, exit at $75 million <laughs> or, you know, just some sort of pie in the sky valuation for their company rather than, than anything that is formulated based on a passion or purpose uh, within the organization or company itself? Yeah, that's a really good question, Eugene. And I usually don't try to tell them something. I usually start asking questions of them. And one technique that I found valuable is to really take them back in time and say, why did you start in this business? Why did you start in this industry? And really what gives you the greatest joy? Another great technique is working with people to say, imagine your business career or your business as a movie and pretend I'm a Hollywood producer and pitch me the ending scene of that movie. What does it look like? What does it sound like? Where are we? What's the musical theme that goes along with it? And it's, it's, um, it's really effective to get people to think more emotionally than just strict revenue wise. And generally the picture in their mind, once we start backing that out, does have revenue numbers associated with it. Okay, we have a question from Al that asks, and then uh, sort of how do you measure success? What are sort of the metrics that you might use in your personal and professional life? Really good questions. There's one of the ways that I actually measure success for my business career is the, the number of business leaders that I enable to reach their goals. And Eugene, here's a plug. This is very easy to measure for those of us using the Align tool, which I do use with my, with my clients, because we can actually measure 
we, right? We input our annual goals, we input our annual rocks, our quarterly rocks, and we can track our success through that. So that's one way that in my business, I do that. But also conversely, I do use uh, Align in, for my personal, my personal vision. And I actually, as my wife and my children can attest to, um, we actually did this process growing up uh, using paper and pen and writing out our goals and tracking those along as well. Glenn, do you mind sharing your BHAG for Apex North Coaching? Uh, yeah, no, that's, I, I don't mind at all. So my BHAG is, is by, I started, I opened up Apex North eight years ago, and my BHAG is to ensure that within the next eight years, seven years now, that I have helped 100 business leaders achieve their goals. And what happens if and when a company achieves their BHAG? That's generally, many times the BHAG could be an exit strategy. It could be the emotional story around that, um, or it would require then the setting of a new BHAG, something uh, far larger. And it's, it's really interesting. I have um, another client's story, a, a CEO that I work with that I can't reveal the exact revenue numbers, but um, when I was working with the CEO to encourage a, a three HAG, what we call the three year highly achievable goal, which is on the road to the BHAG, and um, he th came out with a number and I pushed him. I said, that's not very ambitious. Come on, we need something. And, and so we built up from that. And this was December of last year. We set out a three-year goal for the size of the company and what that would look like and what the revenue goals would look like. And he sent me a note this July, so eight months into the process, seven months into the year, and said, Glenn, we are now tracking this year to surpass our BHAG. So the next conversation, he said, I know in our next meeting, Glenn, you're going to come back and you're going to push us even, even further and higher. Right. Um, Jose asked the question, uh, should core values be linked to the core purpose uh, when establishing your BHAG? And if so, how? I would say they absolutely should be linked. They may not always be directly linked, but many times they are. So the, the sporting goods client I talked to you about, core purpose was really around team and athleticism and people being their best. Those are many of their core purposes they have. They do talk about being their best and being a team player and um, always being there, being part of the play. So those are definitely wrapped into it. I also say they, they should be involved because those are, those are the core fundamental philosophies of a company. Those should not change generally. You, a company, um, they are who they are, they're the people that they are, and generally the purpose why they come together is for a common purpose. Uh, do you have any recommendations on how often a company should revisit its BHAG? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the, re the BHAG should be revisited in depth every single year in the annual planning process, absolutely. I generally also, we, we will review our, our one page strategic plan or growth roadmap in a quarterly basis uh, to review it. We don't modify it or go down deep, but every year we, we really go back and fundamentally re-examine that because one thing I do find, it can, take, it, it can take some time to really come up with a true compelling BHAG core purpose um, and all the way down through your core fundamentals. Uh, for those who are on uh, the webinar, I'm happy to share Align's BHAG. Uh, our BHAG is 1 billion priorities completed. So our goal is really to uh, instill uh, you know, good business habits in all of our customers and users. And their success is them completing priorities, quarterly priorities that they set for themselves as an organization and individuals. So if we can help companies achieve 1 billion priorities completed, that really is our North Star. That's our BHAG, and we have a long way to get there, but that's sort of what drives uh, our direction. Um, we have a few other questions. Alexis asked, um, can you have a BHAG for your family? Is that something that's doable? And if so, do you have an example? Because I do know a lot of people use sort of rock habits and scaling up methodologies mm -hmm. in their own personal lives with their families to set family priorities? Is, is a family BHAG something that, you're, that you've seen? Um, yeah, absolutely. And an example of that, I'll, I'll get, again, I'll give you, um, I set out, I told, talked about my eight year plan and um, my BHAG is, is, revolves up to us. It's, it's um, family, friends, fun, and freedom. 
And so we have specific goals set out along each of those. And, and my wife and I know very well what that means, but that means that for the two of us, we have financial freedom. We are living in a place where we have many friends around us. Um, we're engaged in fun activities. I love uh, cycling and you know I love music. So um, we actually have a vision board with that uh, slogan inscribed at the top of it. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, a question from Florian is, what if people in our company do not like our BHAG while management wants to promote it? Sort of how do you spread the message of the BHAG to all employees within the organization and get their buy-in? Yeah, again, uh, not, not easy. It's, it's a simple answer. It's not easy to do in practice. And when I work with CEOs, I tell them one of their core responsibilities is communication of the vision. And if you ever heard the phrase, someone really doesn't hear something until they hear it seven times, um, it's talking about that, but it's not just communicating it in talking or telling stories, which is really critical about it, but it's living the BHAG. It's living the core values. It's living the core purpose throughout the CEO and the leadership team and all the way down. And, and I'd say an, a, a fortunate, unfortunate thing, um, byproduct maybe, if a company is, doing re is, is really well done, established, they've set up their core purpose and their BHAG and their core values, that they th then need to start taking that through the entire organization. They also need to ensure that everybody on the team does resonate with that. And if there are team members who it doesn't resonate with, it never will, they really should be coached out of the company because they need to find an organization that really does resonate with their, their own personal values and passion. And I assure you, they'll be much happier and much more productive when they do that. Sounds great. Um, I think we've been going for about 45 minutes, unless anybody has any final questions that they'd like to, uh, to post in the chat. We'll give everybody a minute or two if they have any final questions. Seeing none, uh, I want to thank everybody for attending today's coach webinar. A big thank you to Glenn for a great presentation and a, and a, a wonderful conversation. If anybody has any questions about your BHAG as part of your one-page one strategic plan in Align, please don't hesitate to contact your Align advisor directly or email us at support at aligntoday.com. Uh, this webinar has been recorded and we will send you a link to the recording as well as some links to the, uh, the tools that Glenn referenced in his presentation. Um, and again, thanks everybody for joining us and I hope you have a great rest of the week. Take care. Thanks Eugene. Thank you, Glenn.